how do we evaluate deals? I am gonna to touch on valuation, but evaluating a deal is, as I was referring to, really simple. You need to understand that every deal you do has good and bad, and far too often you can't be your own deal killer. Welcome back to the Scaling Fast Lane. I'm Valerie Booth, your guide through the journey of agency growth. In today's episode, we gain insider perspective into the art of the deal from Scale It Speed Media's co-founder, Peter Lang. He's going to give his advice for properly evaluating and structuring acquisitions, arming you with the knowledge about key financial metrics, risk factors, and proven tactics to command favorable terms. You'll come away with an elevated understanding of pricing and valuation of due diligence and deal dynamics, and how to strategically build an acquirable agency empire. Let's listen in and learn deal wisdom from a master negotiator. Typically, people want to get very granular. We've been fairly, I don't want to say high level, it's probably the wrong term for it, but we're, we're not being that specific. This is a very specific topic. Um, this is one that is often, for me at least, the most note taken piece. Uh, it's also the most useful when it comes to you immediately doing deals. So this is within the process of find phase one, phase two is evaluate. This is how do we evaluate deals. I am gonna to touch on valuation, but evaluating a deal is also, as I was referring to, really simple. We tend to make it complex. I'm going to go straight into the simple test. You need to understand that every deal you do has good and bad, and far too often you can't be your own deal killer. Who knows that term, deal killing attorneys, deal killing accountants, who knows that? Okay. The term essentially means they're doing their job. The vast majority of attorneys and CPA, their job is to find the mistakes, find the things to be concerned about, and therefore find the bad things in the deal. Typically the business side, you, are finding the good things, the, the future opportunities, the potential. But I'm not going to cover all the bits covered here because I wanna get into very specific. But these are the 10 rules that if you're valuing a company properly, specifically agency, these are the things that you wanna pay attention to. Feel free to take photos of it Let's move quickly because I need you to be careful of being too optimistic. There are deal makers in this room and what's really helpful is deal marketers. Who here has talked to brokers before? Brokers, who's here talking to brokers before? Those are deal marketers. Those are people out there getting eyeballs on a company that's for sale. They are making it look as good as it possibly can be. It's called the pageantry, the selling. And brokers do typically a range of good to terrible job of making you look as you should be to the market. But I'm gonna get into key bits. Pre-tax profit. The following are ranges. These ranges allow you to put this into a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet then can be used to determine a discount calculation to reduce the purchase price consideration. So uh, pre-tax profit or EBITDA, these are the thresholds. The thresholds are the multiple ranges. So when you typically are about 3 million, 3x to 5x is a safe range. That's why I said be very careful doing large transactions at the very beginning. Below that, if you remember the visual I put up during Tom's talk, anything below 3x. Now, when you start creeping above, this is the arbitrage. The arbitrage also takes into account avenue, uh, annual growth rate. Annual growth rate, the industry thresholds, you need to see 30% year over year. When you see 30% year over year, the, the value of the business, the valuation of the business will go up. If it's below 30%, who here was 30% year over year for the last five years or so, right? That means you consistently have shown a way to grow in line with industry thresholds that won't be a discount factor for your business. But are you going to acquire a business that's growing 30% year over year? I wouldn't suggest a first deal, right? Because that's you paying more than you probably like for your first deal. So this gives you an idea. When we say reduces the value, we're not talking significant reductions, right? We're talking off of both purchase price consideration in cash. Uh, everyone knows what uh, guaranteed payments are, okay? Everyone knows what rollover equity is. Okay, gu guaranteed payments is the cash portion that's guaranteed to a seller. That can be cash on close, that can be cash in installment payments, but it's guaranteed money, not based on performance. In an earnout, it's performance-based. It's hitting certain milestones, and then I get my money. 
So it's not structurally called guaranteed payments. Guaranteed payments also anchor to what brokers want. Brokers typically ask for a percentage of guaranteed payments. That could be cash on close or an installment plan, but they don't usually take from your earnout. This is performance-based. That's how they clean up their transactions. When you have a company that's contributing 30% year-over-year growth, you become a target for a very specific type of buyer. Does anyone know who those buyers are? It's capital markets. Capital markets care about revenue growth, not profit. Private equity cares about profit. So when you're looking at the classification of buyers, when you're going to market to sell a business, it's very important for you to understand this from your own disposition with sellers. Private equity cares about profits, right? Expanding profits and expanding the business. Capital markets care less about profits. They need year over year growth. And when you have a market cap of hundreds of millions of dollars, year over year revenue growth is hard without acquiring it. So they'll pay premiums. So you look at selling your business in the future after you've done a few acquisitions and you maintain 30% organic growth, you tack onto it 20 to 30% growth through acquisitions. You're in north of 50 plus year over year growth, both in the combination of organic sales and acquisitions. You're selling to a capital market strategic, right? It's very straightforward. We're beginning with who would buy us and designing our company, both from an organic perspective, but also from an acquisition to say who would want us and what could we get for it? Another really important bit is looking at that margin. So industry thresholds. If you're around 10% within our industry, it's not ideal we want 20, but it doesn't have a significant impact on the, the overall value of the company. You can talk about uh, various reasons why. But 30%, if you're over 30% profit, how many of you are running 30% profit margin? Good. 30% okay, profit margin shows that you're consistently throwing off cash. What we typically say is I pay present value for future expectations. Have you heard that before? I pay present value for future expectations, meaning the cash flow that's going to be generated from the business, I'll pay you something for it today because I expect it to come in the future with a percentage of growth. These are important. If you're talking about buying a business that is at 10% profit margin, it's about a neutral, if it's below that, you're looking at terms and price adjustments that allow you to move very quickly in the transaction. The problem that you're going to have is some people who are called tire kickers, who are 10% profit margin, uh, owner-operated from a sales perspective, think their companies are worth more. So a lot of this content is information you're feeding to them in the early discussions. Because you need to seed reality when they go online, they Google or talk to a broker who's not experienced in this category. The next one is reoccurring revenue. Projects are interesting. Uh, we have under LOI a wonderful creative company. Amazing clients. Meta, uh, they got Nike, no, not Nike, they have New Balance. And they, they go, we have reoccurring revenue. You have six clients who've been with you and bring you repeat business for many, 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 many years. That's not reoccurring revenue, right? That's project based with a consistent referral source. Happens to be your own client base. But then when you look at future expectations, you're really trying to buy something that is future expectations that's in a contractual obligation. The more you have increases the value of the business. Everyone's heard of a SaaS multiple being different than a service multiple, right? SaaS companies sell for big valuations, service businesses sell for less. It's because SaaS is repeatable kind of programmatic money, right? Just coming in, it's ARR, it's very different. This is a very important distinction. What sellers will try to do is they'll try to prove to you why their project-based business is repeatable. Repeatable is not reoccurring revenue. Let's be very, very clear. And that is something that you'll be challenged with, especially with creative shops who make the bulk of their money from projects. It's really, there's an art to going to market like that. Next one is the top five clients. This is a top five clients, top two clients, top 10 clients. No matter what, we'll find a way to discount it, by the way. Um, it's, it's not that hard. Additionally, when you're looking at uh, client concentration, it's not just by revenue or sales, it's also by EBITDA. So oftentimes they go, well, I have, 
I don't have client concentration issues, but then you narrow down in a per client PNL, and one client is contributing greater percentage of EBITDA than others. People don't always know the numbers. You can also find value in companies with the same level of analysis, but typically 30% is the make or break uh, threshold. Uh, anybody have client concentration in this range? Where, where five of your clients make up uh, more than 30% of your revenue? Yeah, so part of your strategy in doing acquisitions, because it's easily solved through M&A, a little bit more challenging through organic and incremental, is how do I expand my client concentration risk issue, right? By acquiring more clients. And it could be a number of clients, it could be three additional high paying clients. I like consulting firms who have five accounts, recruiting them as an aqua hire, paying them out through the profit contribution of their business assets and then expanding and giving them a piece of the pie for removing my client concentration issue. So you can actually manufacture end destinations of higher value, right? higher enterprise value that's not being discounted by doing small deals because they help solve your business problem, which is client concentration. Clients, average lifetime value. We talk about average order value and we circulate to the room. This is a big one, right? Lifetime value per industry category has benchmarks. Advertising agencies, PR agencies, each classification of service has a baseline average lifetime value as a target and as a performance measure. And then there's people who perform greater than that. So one year is all it is. Isn't that sad? How many of you have only had clients for one year and then you get new clients every year? Right, it's unheard of for this room. But interestingly enough, it's because of one easy, easy identical bit. Sales process. I'm buying my future expectation. I want to see that if you lose and only have someone for one year, you have the ability to sell, sell, sell new business. We care more about the ability to generate new sales than retain beyond the average lifetime value. Right, because if you show me that you had a client for 10 years, the lifetime value is millions of dollars. What's the likelihood they're gonna like me as a new buyer? I wanna see a way to replace it in case I happen to cause a negative impact on the business through the acquisition. Isn't that interesting how you would think that would be a positive, but it's actually a negative? Right? I need to see that the consequence of you taking chips off the table can be resolved very quickly. This is my favorite one. I said to you all, like keeping people for a long period of time is actually negative, right? Client, employee tenure. Three years, it's seen as positive. I don't go into the five year and beyond as a negative in this case, but it's very important to know. One year is neutral. And the reason for this is depending on your category of business and where you are in your professionalized sophistication, uh, the number of people that you have, all of that comes into play into how long people should be with you. Who has ever brought on an intern, mentored them, they move up the ranks? A few of you have done internship model, right? And you move them up. Well, how long does it take for an intern to become productive? The entire time, six months, <laughs> never, whatever that ends up being. The ideal scenario is if you have someone who steps in as a career professional who's already an executive, right? Versus someone who is being developed in your company, it's a very different tenure. So when you're doing a confidential information memorandum, which is a CIM, it's the package that explains your business to the rest of the world, you need to explain the type of people you have employed in the company. And when you're going to buy someone, you wanna understand the type of people they employ. You can hire young people who contribute three, two to three years, do a great job, but then grow out of it because you have a way to replace the talent. That's fine, but you have a system that proves that. A lot of companies that are smaller don't know or don't have a system. They just are happy that people haven't left yet or they're happy people have stayed with them for a long time. You can see how having it be analytical, having the numbers to support it is going to impact the value of the business. Oh, great, the one I talked about. Founder in sales and delivery. Okay, so this is where uh, you get a double hit. If you are selling and you're a part of delivery, you're, you're not gonna be acquired for a high multiple. They're gonna need you to stick around, right? That's, that's gonna be the requirement. You'll see it requires commitment. That's usually gonna be a five-year minimum term. 
and there's gonna be payout incentives based upon performance. If you're also, if you've been removed from selling and you're not involved in any of the production of what you sell, you've just crossed the milestone of maybe getting more value. And the reason why I say that is because now you have to prove you've done it for a long enough period of time. All right, so a lot of owners go, oh, I just got out of delivery or I just got out of sales, my team's in place. I gotta be worth more, right? And then I go, well, show me that you've done that for five years. Show me that you've hired someone to be responsible, you not being in that level of authority, and they've consistently performed to the historical performance you're representing that I pay for today. Because it's interesting, you finally get out of sales, you finally get out of service, and you're selling your business, but your historical financials have you selling and servicing. Right, so it's easy to poke holes in how that can decrease the value of the company. And again, when I say decrease the value, it doesn't mean it has to decrease the purchase price, but it will adjust the terms. Who's heard the expression, your price, my terms? And a lot of people care about the money they're gonna make, the price, and they kind of forget the terms, which is fine. Uh, a lot of people aren't looking to get that big retirement event. A lot of them are just looking to do it with more people. There's a lot of real, solid motivations to do a deal. And, it, and all of them are noble, and all of them have purpose. Yeah, but keep in mind I have 13 minutes to go through a few more of these. Super short question, what's the average earnout period? Like oh, it's five, it's typically five years within our industry. Okay. But the earnout's going to be usually tied to the uncertainty around contracts and relationship with clients. So uh, let's say Ellen, for example. A, a person like Ellen who has a relationship with discovery, and, uh, and, and it's another D probably in there as well, some big brands. And they go, well, Ellen, you own the biggest client relationship. How long before Discovery is comfortable with the replacement? Right? So she's going to be on a five-year earnout. They may go, yeah, but Ellen, you got to be on the board. We need you affiliated. And so there'll be various degrees of expectations. And then there'll be provisions. Provisions would be different milestone thresholds that if you don't perform to the expectations you set, those future expectations <laughs> for present value, you don't get your money. That's why when Tom said 80% of <coughs> sellers and an earnout don't stay is because now your five years of earnout is being employed by someone you don't really want to work for. And if you quit, you don't get your earnout. Founder's age. This is an interesting topic. Uh, there is a sweet spot, obviously. Um, and this does trend in various directions, but you heard me say the expression, die at your desk. I've talked to sellers who said, I'm never going to sell. I'm going to die at my desk. My wife doesn't want me at home. Or... My husband, oh, if my husband sees me around too much, I'm not gonna, I, I have to work. This is my project, my kids are out of the house, what would I do? Not the kind of person you wanna do a deal with, right? Because they have unrealistic expectations to how they're treating the business as an asset, right? An asset should be held not until you die, until it maximizes its value for its stakeholders, and then it's divested or sold for earnings for its owners. So if you're older than 55, it's gonna decrease the value of your business. Why? It's also because you can't stick around that long for the earnout. So 55 leads to 60, 60 is the wrong expectation. In various other cultures internationally, this has a nuance to it. But if you're 40s and you're looking to sell your business, this is why we try to tell you you need multiple transactions, three transactions. If you're selling at 30, you're selling at 40, and you're selling right before you're 50, you're giving all of that upside to the next buyer and they're gonna be willing to commit to you because they know you're gonna really work hard to realize that value of that business. So there's sweet spots of timing of exits, which people don't take into consideration. Also young people. Uh, high value for young people in businesses is another way to negotiate influence. Uh, 27, 28, right? 27 and 28 year old, I'm gonna go, great, he's gonna be an employee for me for at least 10 years. He's like, what? So I'm gonna build in the deal the expectation. It's gonna be harder for him to leave because I know I could have a young, talented person for a longer period of time. So there's a sweet spot in there. Additional factors. Um, these are must ask questions before submitting an LOI. So you're about to submit an LOI, what do we care about knowing? Uh, EBITDA, um, I have a rant on EBITDA. EBITDA means absolutely nothing. Uh, I agree with Warren Buffett in that it's a finance term used to confuse people. Uh, I like cash. Who likes cash? Who likes EBITDA more than cash? Okay, good. Cash is a very simple concept when transacting with someone because I'm buying present value for future expectations. And what the future expectations are in the form of cash, cash, right? 
unless you're building some kind of IPO. I want to understand the cash in the business. That's a lot easier to talk about with sellers as well, right? Most people don't talk about an EBITDA, right? How many of you run Gap and run EBITDA? One, two, three, right? A small amount, right? So when you look at how we think about it, the term EBITDA versus SDE, which is seller discretionary earnings, um, when you're not a seller, it's called owner discretionary earnings. It's the primary metric used by Warren Buffett, and Warren Buffett can do you know, $100 million deals in two hours because he's looking at the discretionary earnings of a company, not EBITDA. And EBITDA means accountants touched it, finance people touched it, and that means it's not real. That means it's been cleaned a little bit. When you look at the earnings or the distributions of a company, that's a consistent financial outcome that I can set future expectations for. So that's what we like. How much money is this making? How much profit does that? How much cash do you distribute to your team or partners or owners? Right? Talk in very simple terms when dealing with sellers. Uh, this is a very annoying thing um, in the calculation of SDE. Who's done a calculation with SDE with a seller before? Okay, calculation of seller discretionary earnings is them trying to maximize the number you're going to put the multiple on. And so they're going to come back with one-time adjustments. They're going to say, I added back marketing investment because I didn't need it. Right? They're going to come back with all these adjustments that is not the cash in the business. And so I love running a forecast that is adjusted for them. How many of you run your business off of a pro forma? Great, okay, great. So when you build out a pro forma, hopefully it's budget actual and it's got some historical proof that you've been able to hit the budgets, right? Companies that operate with a pro forma or a budget versus actual model has some cadence of reporting similar to a public company, preferably quarterly, they have higher value because they've been able to show me their discipline with money, discipline with cash, how they invest it, how they plan for it. Well, when you start getting into SD for it's classified as a USME, unsophisticated small to mid-sized enterprise, because everybody in US businesses are called mid-sized enterprises. These are the unsophisticated classification, it means they don't have gap, they're owner-operated, it's also called main street businesses, small businesses, car washes, laundry mats, all sorts of businesses. You need to understand and train your deal team, the people involved, to sniff out ad backs. Challenge the financials and the numbers that are represented in the SDE, even if they're provided by a broker and they're prepared. Okay? And then in your LOI, the reason why we say these are must, you need to have always the statement, this is completely based off of what you provided and you know, subject to due diligence. All right? I may not change the multiple if, if it doesn't fluctuate the EBITDA or SDE by a certain percentage of total value. So if it's a $700,000 business in EBITDA SDE profit, and I happen to see that they adjusted a little bit too enthusiastically, and it goes down to 500,000, I may say that's a material reduction that I need to reevaluate my multiple. And you gotta flag that within the first week of due diligence. We talk about confirmatory being at the end of due diligence in traditional M&A. What I always want is confirmatory financial the first week of due diligence. So there's a, I, I don't want to invest time, money in something that isn't going to pan out because of what they've represented. I have to coach them, educate them, because everything is messy. So definitely they have tax people, they have accountants, they have trusted advisors who will provide you better detail. In pre-DD for them, it was just our basically head of accounting and finance, which is a CPA working with their CPA. And so we are very confident in the numbers that we included in the LOI because it was CPA to CPA, not business owner CPA being a filter for it. And, and you gave direction to your CPA? We gave a form. We want managerial, we want yeah. accrual, we want... Okay. Yeah, we give a form document um, and we say, here's how we calculate SDE, uh, here's how we want your adjustments, and then our team actually goes line by line through every transaction to make sure those adjustments are valid. And then we also set a business forecast to say, but are we going to need that thing? Are we going to need that thing? I know you'd like to add it to the, everything's nice when you add a you know, three or a five to it. You always want to add a little bit more because that multiple's great. But we have to have a pragmatic, realistic talk about does that make sense? And if it's, again, within a range, I'm, I'm happy to fluctuate even if it goes up. My job is to acquire EBITDA. 
I'm more than happy giving you money for the EBITDA. I just need to make sure that it performs to my expectations, right? Um, let me go on one more on this because this actually might be helpful. Um, when you do uh, any level of SDE calculations, uh, I highly recommend using a third party tool. So you can actually look up the California brokerage associations. They provide an SDE tool. I like using other people's uh, resource docs so they don't think I've created bias in it. Okay? So we keep it in there. Like when we run discounted cash flows, it's a very consistent, publicly available discounted cash flow model. We just know how to input correctly into it. So these types of things I highly recommend. You don't have everything tailored to you. Um, I want to be careful creating an environment with a seller where they feel like they, they're getting take, they might get taken advantage of because they don't know it. And that can happen very easily. In your financials, are you including a statement of cash flows like in yep. direct method? Yeah, we do. So most agencies are run off of cash. Yep. Uh, typically, you, uh, accrual is what we need to be operating. So when you know, money is earned is when it's service, and not a lot of companies operate that way. And so you always have some degree of uh, Rosetta Stone of saying, this is how they're managing their books. The most important person within a transaction is the bookkeeper. Not the accountant, not the business owner. Whoever's managing the chart of accounts. If you're properly building out your chart of accounts, I can read your financial statements and understand your business. If I read your financial statements and I don't know what your business is, and how it operates, you don't know how to label your chart of accounts and manage it appropriately. So you can actually, it should tell a story. It's, it's, it's like CPA porn. You should look at it and slightly be aroused. Do you spend yes. a lot of time renegotiating the chart of accounts no. in the reports? No, no, What's above you the figure line? out a range. So okay. typically what we're doing is because you want to get out of a, uh, we call it a price adjustment. No one likes price adjustments. <laughs> I don't know about you, if someone, once you say a number, and you give a range, they anchor to the biggest number possible. Even if you give a range, they anchor to the biggest multiple. And so you try to get out of uh, renegotiating your deal. Um, it can really hurt you, it's unnecessary, especially when you're not fast to LOI. A lot of people move too quick to LOI. Darren, because he was uh, 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 backed, has a story, ask him later, about how he got LOI signed and thank goodness you're not in the room with Darren when he was doing those back in the day. Uh, flying into a city, having two people you wanted to buy, and saying, I'm in this room, if you don't sign this, I go to the next room, and then I fly, I'm leaving here, because I have to do this amount of deals at this cadence. Do you want it? Do you want it? Sign the terms. High pressure. They were compelling terms. They were compelling terms. That's, <laughs> yeah, they have to be compelling terms. So uh, it's, in, it's very important, though, to look at the revenue streams. Right, where money's coming from. So when you get financial statements, great, I love financial statements. I care about a company, so a client, for that term, so how long they'll continue to pay on that, and I wanna see what it looks like month to month. Don't give me annuals. Revenue stream by client, by sector, month over month over month. I'm trying to understand the business. Right? So when someone sends you, they go, here's my, here's my financials, they'll send you the annuals. You can't learn anything from the annuals. You gotta see how the monthly cash flow within the business operates so you can really understand it. Your job in due diligence is to understand their business hopefully better than they do because it's soon going to be your business. There's nothing in redacted, no clients. I'm not gonna, yes, M&A is one of the primary ways of poaching IP and clients. It really is, by the way, as well as talent. Uh, it's a, it's a, it can be a very disruptive tool if used in evil ways. Additionally, there's a reason why it can be used that way. You have to be vulnerable. You have to disclose, or else as a buyer, I won't get comfortable giving you money for what you're providing me, right? And so I care about revenue streams, I care about the sources, I care about the locations. Management structure. Um, your corporate structure is very important. And oftentimes people don't begin with the end in mind and build the organization structure to maximize their ownership, maximize their exit value. How many of you have your holding company managed by a trust? Right? Is that trust in Nevada or Wisconsin? No, in Georgia. 
Uh, okay, it's in Georgia. Georgia has not the best. You usually want to leave Georgia. Uh, but ideally, when you think about how you organize your structure, right? If any of you are looking to do deals, there's certain organizational structures that support doing deals a little bit more efficiently, as well as divestitures or exits. So you got to think, is my organizational structure, is my management structure, is my incentives to my management team, all these things connected. Um, I am almost out of time, uh, so I'm going to skip to diversified risk. Uh, diversified risk is interesting. Um, what people don't present is the churn rates of clients. So remember I was talking about the sales process, I was talking about uh, conversion rates, number of leads. I want to see clients churn, the churn naturally, but I also want to see that you understand it. These are the levels of detail people don't get into into due diligence. When you go to a company like Generational Equity, you go to their event, they build your CIM, which is a template. What they tend to do is give you stock inputs so you can present your company a certain way. And all generational equity companies that are marketing services or digital agencies look exactly the same. And all of the forecast is a hockey stick. <laughs> Whatever last year's growth was, let's just continue to go more. With this, clients churn. How many of you have lost clients? Yeah, clients churn. But yet when you interact with sellers, they'll pretend or they'll communicate or they'll represent that they don't churn clients. Okay? And again, these are things that you want to see how they've diversified risk within the portfolio. In Felix's book, it's called a risk register. We ask sellers to build the risk register. Who's built the risk register in 2i3x yet? Next quarter. You haven't done it yet? It's next quarter? The risk register is listing out all the risks to your business and how you're going to address them and giving it a priority and then, then understanding what to do if that happens. Imagine how nice it is that you've mitigated my risk by providing me the risk register to your business of how you'll handle all the uncertainty. Because then when I negotiate with you and I bring up those risks, it can't be a surprise. If I bring up the risks, I'm going to discount your business. I'm going to ask for more favorable terms for me. If you present the risks with solutions, I'll be more comfortable and confident giving you the deal terms that you're more comfortable with. Yes, Tim. Are you typically doing a stock, a stock sell or an asset sell? Asset deal. So, so uh, can that remove the need, the fear of loans, liens, and whatnot? Yeah, you would hope, right? No. Yeah. You can be sued for anything. So the good news is even when you do an asset deal, you can be sued for anything by anyone. Uh, whether or not they win is a whole different thing. There's a whole category of litigation that is going after people for the sake of them just settling. And so you have to be very careful, this on the employment law side, but also in transaction. When you announce your transaction, if you're seen as the money, you become a target. That's why those mergers don't always announce. So ultimately, yes, risk mitigation is a special purpose vehicle. It's an entity that's underneath your entity, and every transaction exists within a special purpose vehicle, not your main operating business. Where you run payroll is not, when you tr not where you transact, unless you have a very specific type of aqua hire model where you're just adding them to the operating company. When you're doing uh, an economic deal, an economic deal is where you have consideration in the form of cash being deployed to another company in exchange for the value or the, of the assets, you need that transaction and that liability in at least one or two steps below your holding company. So what does that mean? Trust holding company, operating company, transaction, okay? And then you employ everyone at the operating company, but you hold the assets here. You then bill clients from the asset, and you just have a sweep account up. And that's how you separate a lot of the risks. So if you already have your company set up that way today, how attractive is that to a prospective buyer? Right, because you've done acquisitions, you've properly set the playing field, the table, for you to maximize your value, de-risk the uncertainty for them, and for you to go to the table and go, I know how deals get done. I've heard another, where you have another holding company, each owner has that, they put all of their, like the car, the kid shit, goes in the other holding company, yeah. and they have an invoice back. Yeah. Is it worth the pain in the ass to get that done? So it, it, well, it, it, it depends, you can. So again, depends on the end in mind, right? Right, you, there's tax efficiencies that are realized there, uh, but those tax efficiencies uh, don't have a lot of positive implication when you exit. It's just a way for you to clean break 
the personal uh, ad backs, right? You can say, it's just one service company. I don't have to go line by line through the expenditures of the company. I don't have to track that over time. It's centered in this one line item. We're also, we're writing a book. 100%. Yeah, so if you, if you, for example, how we're constructed is a good example. Uh, we don't talk about this publicly, but every person within our holding companies are all employed in the same company. It's called Competitive Advantage. Competitive Advantage is one payroll company. Everyone's there. We have an MSA, a master service agreement between every entity, and then we have allocation, and then we have sweep accounts. Money just moves up. Okay? And so what we've been able to do there is isolate operational liabilities, payroll liabilities, revenue potential and liabilities, and be able to create joint ventures. Because when you have everybody in one entity, they work for that one company. When you have everybody a part of a payroll office with service agreements for your portfolio, you now have the ability to take minority interests in other companies and service it. So then you can divest the JVs too. Yep. And that's a lot easier because you've already detached the primary staff for the overhead and back office. And so that opens up a whole new realm of transactions. Because usually our transaction model is 100% purchase of the assets with a rollover component of the purchase consideration. And the, that's great. That's great. That's absolutely great. Then you put all of the, uh, it's called a micro roll-up. You put the individuals within a platform. You put the assets below them in a subsidiary. And then you operate that. And then you can divest that. And you can acquire into that. And it's housed in a nice little micro roll-up or a micro platform. It's a fantastic model. The only problem with that is when you're buying 100% of the assets and you're doing that construct, you're leaving money on the table. When you already have a back office that services that, you can do minority interest deals. And due to the 40 Act, you can't take minority positions in companies. That's an investment company. You'd have FINRA to report to. And it ain't fun reporting to FINRA if you don't have to. So how do you have minority interest in companies and expanding portfolio where you have 100% buyout of the assets and minority interests? Because you have a back office service company, you can earn into those minority interest positions. So it just gives you a whole new playing field that which you can transact and diversify risk. Is the back office service versus service company, LLC, partnership, C-Corp, what's the Disregarded entity. Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. Uh, the vast majority of the portfolio, until you get into partnerships, right, are disregarded entities. Yeah, yeah. Where you start bringing on partners to build out expanding business units or take minority positions in, those are you know, partnerships. Yeah. So the same thing with the subsidiary that's holding the assets, that's a disregarded entity. And then you can have a disregarded entity payroll? Yes. Man, yes. Yes. Uh, use a PEO for it. We use Sequoia. Um, I'm out of time uh, because we're going to be talking about some deal bits. Uh, has this been useful? It was a fast, quick bit. Yeah, real good. Uh, I only want to give you one more bit. <laughs> this problem right here. Industry. Being a media company for healthcare, an SEO for law firms, these can be really good ways to build roll-ups. Okay? So they're industry topic-based acquisitions. Is anyone positioned that way in this room? Yours is? Supply chain, nothing but trucks. Nothing but trucks, so, so, uh, but logistics? Trucks, planes, and boats. Yeah, so logistics as a general category, right? And so like Johansson Transportation, which is one of the largest uh, brokers of uh, tractor trailers, those types of businesses are ones that you service, right? And so if you look at it, you could say, I can either acquire into categories that service the same customer base, I can acquire just like me. But when you niche down, you, it's really good for increasing value for a very small buyer set. Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Could I offer to buy the supply chain piece of, I don't know, some giant PR firm? Yeah, you can look at divisions. What you're referring to is business divisions within a PR yeah. firm, right? You can do you can do any deal you want. Yes. Yeah, you can go to them and say, you know, this is one bit of your client service yeah. delivery. I'd like to carve that out yeah. and and do a transaction for that client base and that brand and reputation. Yes, you can make up. This is the joy of deals. This is why I say I only do deals. You can make up anything. Deals are based upon your creativity for exchange of value. And so you can find it anywhere. You talked about, uh, I'm going to pull him up now. Ashton. Yes, Ashton, come on up. We're going to get into your hot seat, but I want to use you as a quick guinea pig. May I? You good being a guinea pig? Sure. Why not? Can you be a rabbit or a guinea pig? Which one would you prefer? 
<laughs> rabbit? Oh, rabbit, yeah. Rabbit, okay, rabbits are better than guinea. Guinea pigs make too much noise when you're trying to sleep. Uh, here, he has how many companies within the family? Three. He has three. How many of them did you start from scratch? All of them. All of them, all right? The staffing company, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What could he have done instead of starting it? Could have acquired it, right? So oftentimes when you're looking at it, your staffing company's positioning is what? Uh, for marketers. Right, staffing for marketers. Have you ever seen a staffing for marketers agency? Staffing agency? So a lot of the ways we as entrepreneurs <coughs> build things is turn on its head when you think, I don't need to build it from scratch. Now, we are gonna talk about an M&A example. Uh, give them some context, let's talk about the deal. And you have some questions too, right? Uh, I have a list of questions, but we, the M&A example was, I would love to walk through one, but I don't have one, I think. Okay. So here's where the gamut for him is going to change. If he can change his model to you now he has a staffing company, what's the next thing he should do to grow that staffing company? Buy a staffing company. He's now created a portfolio that he can buy into and build micro roll-ups within his ecosystem, his flywheel. The biggest thing that people don't remember is you have to do a culturally aligned deal or else your deals won't work. The more ways you have to transact with prospective sellers with a variety of cultures, the more deals you can do. He's in a good position. He has a holding company. He's building a flywheel ecosystem, right? But he's gonna be limited to some degree by the cultural matches of the flywheel brand. You can keep those brands separate, keep the cultures unique, and then do more acquisitions because you're not trying to find one culture alignment. You can find multiple culture alignments with whoever the executive managers are of those brands. Thanks for listening to the Scaling Fastlane podcast. If you enjoyed this content and are looking for a more immersive experience, Join us at the next Scale at Speed live event. It's packed with dynamic content, expert insights, and a room full of like-minded, action-oriented agency leaders. Come elevate your scaling journey in person. Visit scaleatspeedlive.com to ensure your spot today. We can't wait to see you there.